In 1992, Prime Minister Brian Mulroney and the 10 provincial premiers attempted to ratify a new constitutional accord. The Charlottetown Accord was an attempt to bring Quebec back into the Constitution. It also had provisions to recognize Indigenous self-government, decentralize many federal powers, reform the Senate and House of Commons, and to codify a social charter involving social programs, trade, employment, and many other aspects of Canadian life. A series of people's forums, committees, conferences, and consultations were held across the country. These activities occurred in the lead up to a referendum where Canadians could vote either yes for the accord or no against the accord. In the months before the referendum, there was an enormous and fractious debate. The referendum campaigns weren't split along traditional political lines. NAC, the National Action Committee on the Status of Women, the largest women's organization in the country, was a strong voice on the no side. In this interview with Judy Rebick, who was the president of NAC at that time, we discuss why feminists opposed this constitutional change, what the campaign was like, and how the referendum affected the Canadian women's movement. Uh, welcome. We're here today speaking with Judy Rebick, uh, and she is going to tell us a little bit about the Charlottetown Accord. Uh, Judy, first, can you just introduce yourself? Okay, my name, as you said, is Judy Rebick, uh, Judy, and I, I'm a writer, I guess, now. I'm also a coach. Is that what you call it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Leadership coaching and communications coaching. This is my new my new job. Um, and uh, I've been an activist for close to 50 years, starting in the 60s in the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement. And then I became, I was on the far left for a while and uh, people probably know me best from my work in the women's movement. I was the spokesperson for the Ontario Coalition for Abortion Clinics in the 80s when we won legal abortion. And then I was president of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women, which is what we're here to discuss. Charlottetown Accord happened while I was president of NAC. So can you describe a little bit about what the Charlottetown Accord was and why it was important for women? Okay. Well, the Charlottetown Accord was an amend a proposed amendment to the Constitution. When the Constitution was, uh, Canadian Constitution was brought back from Britain because we didn't actually have a Constitution in Canada. It was Pierre Elliott Trudeau who did that. And um, Quebec refused to sign that Constitution. That was in, um, I guess, 19, I'm not good with dates, but anyway, you can... <laughs> whenever it was. I think it was 82. So Quebec refused to sign that constitution because they didn't feel it gave them enough power. So for whatever reason, Brian Mulroney, when he came into power, he was desperate to amend the constitution so that Quebec would sign it. And he developed Meech, the Meech Lake Accord, which was a couple of years before Charlottetown. And the Meech Lake Accord uh, declared that Quebec was a distinct society, okay, which meant Quebec could have different powers than the other provinces. And um, Quebec supported it, and the women's movement in Quebec supported it, but a lot of women in the women's movement in English Canada was against it because they felt that it set up a hierarchy of rights and that the the particularly the Section 15, which had, well, it wasn't with was Section 15 of the Charter, um, the amendment to make Quebec a distinct society would give Quebec power over Section 15, which was women's rights and other rights. And that, and the women in English Canada argued that Quebec, for example, could make abortion illegal when it was legal in the rest of the country. Well, this really annoyed the women in Quebec, given that Quebec made abortion legal before the rest of Canada, because uh, the Supreme Court I mean, not the Supreme Court, but Henry Morgenthaler had been acquitted by juries twice and the PQ government just decided not to apply the law. So it created a big uh, 
split between the women in English Canada and the women in Quebec. And my view, this was before I was president of NAC, was that this was a big mistake, that if the reason that women opposed the Meech Lake Accord was because it put women at threat in Quebec, and we had to take the lead from the Quebec women, not from the English Canadian women. So I spent a lot of time arguing in favor of the Meech Lake Accord, actually, inside of NAC. NAC didn't take a position because of that division, but it was generally understood in Quebec that the women's movement in English Canada helped to sink the Meech Lake Accord, which everybody in Quebec wanted. Okay? So it did, it got sunk actually by uh, Elijah Harper, who stood up in the Winnipeg, in Winnipeg, in the, um, he was an MLA at the time. I think he was the first Indigenous MLA. And he stood up with an eagle feather and he refused unanimous consent because it had to have unanimous consent for it to be passed in Manitoba. So, so when I came in as president, which was, an ex, which was right on the cusp of Meech Lake, it was just at the point of being defeated. In fact, my first act as president was to speak at a rally for Elijah Harper in Winnipeg. So, that, so it was right at the end. And, and I, um, and anyway, I made the healing of Quebec and the women in Quebec and the women in English Canada a priority when I ran for president, that and making NAC more diverse, more representative of uh, of the Canadian population, particularly in terms of women of color and indigenous women, um, women with disabilities. So, uh, so that's how I came in was on that issue. And um, so when Charlottetown came along, which was his next attempt, so he did it a different way. He decided that um, we, he needed more popular input. So they had these constitutional conferences across the country. They had five of them. And who went to these constitutional? It was a really an amazing process of democracy. 25% um, of the people were chosen by lottery, just ordinary citizens who applied to go. Uh, I think then there was another 25% which were social movements and unions, another 25% that was business, and the other 25% were politicians. And that was sort of a composition. And also indigenous groups were invited as well. Uh, but they didn't come to all of them, just to the one on Indigenous self-government. And it was on, in Halifax, they had uh, the Conference on Division of Power, um, which is, would all provinces have the same amount of power, or would Quebec have special powers? So that was that issue. Um, the Then uh, free trade among the provinces, which we also didn't agree with, but we didn't take a strong position on that. The unions did, though, and that was in Montreal. Uh, indigenous self-government was in Toronto, and an elected Senate was in Alberta. Okay. And, uh, and we, NAC, I went to most of them. Uh, Alberta, somebody else went, but I went to most of them and represented NAC. And on, and our position, we, we debated our position. We had a committee which was made up of women from Quebec, women, Indigenous women, and women from English Canada, and then we added a woman of color. And we developed this position that Canada was composed of three nations, each of which was multicultural and multinational, and each of which had the right to self-determination. And the way that Canada should be reconstructed is by negotiation among those three nations as equals. Okay, it was a very advanced position that we took. And when we were in Halifax, um, the federal government was kind of surprised by the position we took because they figured we had opposed Meech Lake, which as I explained, we never really did. And we were in favor of, NAC at that point decided we were in favor of Quebec having the powers it wanted, but we didn't want to decentralize all federal power because we were afraid it would threaten childcare. So we argued for Quebec having different powers than the other provinces. And they called that asymmetrical federalism. And they were actually quite pleased that we took that position because that was their position in each lake. So um, we, we actually won this position, the three nations position. We won it in the, in the Halifax conference. It was amazing actually. And, you know, I tell a story that in, 
in, in the workshop I was in in Halifax, there was a woman from New Brunswick and she was really mad at Quebec. At the beginning, she was saying, Quebec, I always get everything. They're so selfish. They only think about themselves, blah, blah, blah. And there was a senator there, I think it was from Quebec. And he explained what, why, why, what they wanted and, and why they wanted it. And that didn't really affect the other provinces. It was just that they needed these powers to protect their language. And at the end, he, she, she, she understood that. And she thought, oh yeah, I, I, I understand that better. And she supported the um, special powers for Quebec position. And that's what happened. We were able to persuade people of our position. You know, it was actually a democratic um, process. Also, I had spoke to Rosalie Abella, who was the chair of that session. And um, so, she, so I, and I told her what we were going to do. And she said, well, I'll make sure you have the space to do it. And she did. She, she gave us the space. So it was kind of cool, really cool and, and surprising. Um, so then we went to all the other ones and we pretty well won our position. We won our position uh, in Alberta. We wanted 50% for elected Senate. We wanted 50% women in the Senate. And the right, uh, at that point, the Reform Party, wanted um, proportional representation. And so we made it an alliance with them to agree to a proportional representation because we knew we'd get a lot more women that way. That was Doris Anderson. I'd always thought that we should have supported proportional representation. That was the first time I'd ever even heard of it. You know, so we went with that as a compromise, and we won that at the at the Alberta. But it was a right wing position, also. And then um, the indigenous people, having seen these victories, at first they were going to boycott the whole thing because they hadn't been involved, right? But they went en masse to Toronto and we supported them and we won Indigenous self-government. Then um, Montreal, we didn't go, but the labor movement went and they defeated free trade among the provinces because they didn't want that. So, the, so popular forces won our position at all the constitutional conferences. So of course, what did they do? They, they had to get agreements from the premiers because that's the constitutional process of amendment. And they went behind closed door. They met in Charlottetown. That's what it was called, the Charlottetown Accord. And um, they invited indigenous organizations, but just the male organization. We call them the male because at that time they had no women at all in them. And, um, and NWAC, the Native Women's Association of Canada, was really upset that they weren't invited. So we demonstrated at Charlottetown for two reasons. One, because we wanted to be there so we could comment on what they come up with. And two, because the Native Women's Association wanted us to. So we did. And the media ignored us at first. Um, but what ha two things happened that <clears throat> made us a little more, uh, excuse me, powerful, if you want. The first thing that happened was that um, was that the proportional representation in the Senate was defeated by the premiers. They didn't want to get into it. But Nova Scotia and Ontario supported, and that was Bob Ray at the time, supported uh, they would have 50% women in their Senate nominations. Okay, so that was our victory. Joe Schlesinger, who was a a veteran CBC reporter, he said to the others, you're crazy. You know how much influence they had in the conferences? If they don't agree with this, it's going to have trouble passing to the other reporters, right? So he really paid attention to what we we're doing. When they came out of that Charlottetown Accord, they had, um, they did have Indigenous self-government, although we hadn't seen the language yet, but the Native women were against it because their view was that the language meant that their quality rights won't, wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be um, defended. And they had been fighting for a decade already, more than a decade, uh, for it, what they called Indian Rights for Indian Women. That was the name of their organization. And, and that was because the new uh, Human Rights Act didn't cover the Indian Act. And therefore, if an Indian, an Indian that is a status Indian, woman married outside, married a white person, um, that she would lose her status, lose her home, 
lose her ability to live on the reserve. And the men didn't. The men didn't do that. So, uh, so they, didn't, they opposed it for that reason. And we didn't know yet what we thought of the actual Charlottetown Accord until we had a chance to study it. And when we did have a chance to study it, there were three big objections. One was the Native women objection, both that they hadn't been included in the consultation and two, that they weren't protected. The second one was the division of power, which seemed to us to be highly decentralized and it would, and the childcare people were sure that it would make it almost impossible to have a national childcare. But the third thing, which would have been very easy to fix was they wrote a Canada clause and our lawyers felt that that Canada clause created a hierarchy of rights and that women's rights would be undermined by it, okay? So we, so we first thing we did, because we knew Mulroney, after, after the Charlottetown Accord came out, Mulroney made a statement saying, if you didn't vote yes in the referendum, you were a traitor to Canada. This is the prime minister said that, okay? So we, and he wasn't like Donald Trump, you know, he didn't always say crazy things. So he took it seriously when he said something. And so the first thing we did was we had a consultation of as many women's groups as we could get to Ottawa and everybody hated the Charlottetown Accord, okay? Like there was no support for it. Then we had a meeting of our executive, which is how we made decisions. And we had it, like I say, we had a constitutional committee and we knew we'd pay a heavy price if we oppose the Charlottetown Accord. So we, so we, didn't, we didn't take a position, the committee. And my own position was we, should, we are against it, but there's no way we can wage a campaign like this, an electoral campaign. And, the, and I had gone the week before to see Bob White, who was the president of the Canadian Labor Congress, who, you know, with whom we had been in alliance on almost everything. And I went and told him, you know, the problem with the accord and that the left had to oppose the accord. And he said, well, the NDP is the left too, and they're supporting the accord, so we're going to support it. So we didn't have the labor movement, and usually we did on our issues. So, um, so we decided it's a constitutional committee. We wouldn't, we wouldn't take a position. We would go around the executive once we had presented our concerns. Nobody would want to say yes, but we could abstain. We could just not participate or say it wasn't worth supporting or something like that, or we could campaign, campaign for the no. And of course, the other problem we had was that the only people at this point campaigning for a no were the sovereigntists called separatists, right? The sovereigntists in Quebec and Preston Manning and the Reform Party. So we were like, in fact, Terry Mosher, who was a cartoonist for the Gazette, probably most famous political cartoonist in the country at the time, did a cartoon of me and Preston Manning and Lucien Bouchard sort of looking at each other like in bed together. You know? <laughs> it wasn't sexist at all. It was just like, holy shit, what are we doing in bed together? <laughs> and it was very emotional because Sandra Delarond, who was a Métis woman who was on the executive at the time, brought a shawl. And she was wearing this shawl and she said her, her mother gave it to her so that the ancestors would be in the room with us when we made our decision, right? So it was very moving. That was very moving, even for me. And I was really not very open to my feelings at the time. <laughs> I was still pretty dissociated. And even me, I was brought to tears by that. Joe Clark okay, who was the minister in charge of this constitutional thing, and who, by the way, is a very nice person. My brother's like, how can he be a nice person? He's on Mulroney's cabinet, but he really is a good guy. And he called me the night before the uh, meeting, and he said, Judy, we need you guys to say yes to this, because they had just done a poll in BC, and the majority was against. And I said, well, you should have thought about rewriting the Canada Clause, because I don't think we're going to say yes, you know? So anyway, we had this meeting, it was an amazing meeting and every woman, and we had a very diverse executive by that time, because that was like the last year I was president of NAC. And we had, um, I ha we had proposed this executive where at least one vice president would be from one of the, what we call designated groups. Those are the employment equity language. So women of color, um, indigenous women, women with disability or immigrant women. women. So, um, so anyway, we had, we had 
implemented that. And as a result, we had a lot of women of color and indigenous women on the executive. That NAC executive is probably the most representative group I've ever been in. And there were labor women, there were women who worked in women's centers, like it was really representative of the feminist movement. And every single person but one said, I've talked to women in my community and they're against it, right? And so we decided to go for the no. And um, it was incredible what happened. NAC announced, NAC says no, it was a headline in every newspaper. And Trudeau had said no, um, that is Pierre Trudeau opposed it, okay? <laughs> so about two days before us, so it's hard to know what swung the vote to the no. I think Pierre Trudeau's no was part of it and our no was definitely part of it. Because a lot of people on the left were uncomfortable, but the only people opposing it were on the right. So, so here was NAC, which was quite at that time seen as a left-wing group and saying no. So that's then started like the most insane experience of my life, you know, in terms of the amount of work that it was and the amount of pressure on me. It was unbelievable. Like I was in two to three cities a day, giving four to five speeches a day, debating cabinet ministers. And then at night, I would have to do questions and answers because the rest of the executive was doing this too, right? Right across the country, debating the Charlottetown Accord. And like at one point, I, uh, you know, and I had a cell phone. Okay. Now the cell phone, it was about this big, you know, about this big, as big as a book. And um, it weighed like a few pounds. And it was so expensive that we had to rent it. We couldn't afford to buy it, even though we'd raised $50,000 for the campaign, which was a lot of money in those days. We still couldn't afford to buy a cell phone. Okay, that's how expensive we were. But I had this cell phone so that the media could get a hold of me and the staff could. And I'll never forget as I was in the back of a van in Winnipeg. I was so exhausted, it was near the end. And the guy said to me, um, the reporter said, where are you? And I really had no idea what city I was in, let alone. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked out the window and I saw a Portage in Maine. Oh, I'm in Winnipeg. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was something. I, I was a very public figure by then. But still, you know, I, one of the things I did, one of the first things I did was speak to a class at SFU. You know, it was just a class. So I was just like, you know, going off and saying, and if they don't do this, we're going to occupy every federal office in the country. Next day, a front page of the Globe and Mail, NAC plans occupations across the country. <laughs> we didn't do it. We hadn't even talked about it. But I got, had to get used to the fact that everything I said was news, you know, <laughs> even when I was just riffing, right? So it was, it was an incredible experience. You did touch on this, but I'm going to ask it again, because I'd like to get a specific, you know, talk about it specifically, which is uh, one of the concerns about uh, both Meech Lake and the Charlottetown Accord was the hierarchy of rights. Mm -hmm. um, can you, uh, that, uh, that women's equality as gained in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms could be superseded by provincial or other rights. Can you explain this concept and outline why it was a threat to Canadian women? First of all, I should say this was prior to a full understanding of intersectionality, right? And um, also it came mostly from liberal feminists who, who had a very rights-based rather than a liberation-based, if you know what I mean. Like, like my feminism was always a, a, an idea of transforming society, which would be the only way that women would get full right. But of course, there were also liberal feminists who, who just thought there had to be formal and legal equality for us to get rights, okay? So there was a tension on that. And NAC uh, represented all the currents of the women's movement. So there were always tensions. Um, you know, later there was tensions around race and, and, but earlier it was tensions around these political differences, right? There were also radical feminists who saw, saw men as the problem, right? And so, uh, so we, there were always a lot of differences. Um, and this was a difference we had, but we uh, deferred to the people whose expertise it was. And these were the same women who had fought in the original 72, you know, when, when uh, that's it, what, 72, when Trudeau brought back the constitution, they had fought for 
not only for the section 15, which was the equality section, but section 28, which says notwithstanding anything else in the charter, men and women are equal, right? Which has created more problems than it was worth. But anyway, that's a different story. So, um, so they were very ferocious about protecting that. And they felt this overriding Canada clause was uh, interfering with that and that uh, language rights or religious rights could over could overturn um, women's rights. And of course, the abortion issue was an obvious one there. Um, and uh, they were worried about Quebec, right? So that was the argument there. They felt it made language rights more important than women's rights. And of course, you know, with the charter, because all these rights are in an equal plane in section 15, if there's a, a conflict, it's the courts that make the decision. And they didn't want they didn't want it to be undermined that way. That was their view. Um, so the Charlottetown Accord went to a public referendum, which was mm -hmm. different than previous um, attempts to amend the constitution, uh, like like Meech Lake. Um, the, and so the yes and no sides campaigned to the public for the vote. Although obviously there's a public aspect to any campaign, but how did the referendum? affect the style of campaigning? Was it more of a media circus than other campaigns? Oh yeah, like we were in the media every single day. I was on the national two to three times a week, okay? So I was like, I was like the leader of a party, okay? That's how they treated me because Preston Manning and I in English Canada, Preston Manning and I were the leaders of the no campaign and we would, I would never appear on a platform with him, okay? that was. We decided that from the very beginning, we would never appear on a platform with the Reform Party. And at that time, I was actually better known than he was, right? So, uh, so I was the spokesperson for the no side, for the left wing no side, progressive no side, and he was, so, and because of the, it was an electoral campaign, like they do in, a, in a, an election campaign, they had to give equal time to the yes and the no side. And even though we had no money, they had all the money, but, I mean, we had almost no money. Like I said, we got, we raised $50,000 and they had hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? So, um, but they were very arrogant, right? Because they had all the important people on their side and we were so grassroots. It was a glimpse of what social media could do because we didn't have social media yet at that point. But what we did have was cheap movie cameras, right? And um, people started doing these sort of homemade commercials for the no side and, and um, kind of like, you know, videos on YouTube now, but maybe a little less sophisticated. And, um, and the media, you know, gave them equal time with the yes side sophisticated television commercials. And so you would see these really quite charming homemade commercials, like one of with Mulroney as a used car salesman trying to sell us the Charlottetown Accord, which is just a painted version of the Meech Lake Accord, <laughs> for example, right? That was a popular one. And the, and the Native Women's Association, they had $10,000 and they spent it all on doing a video on why this was no good for Native women. And a lot of people told them, a lot of Indigenous people told them this is the real, when I saw this, I decided no way I'm voting for this accord, right? So, um, so it was, and like I say, the, we had a debate politicians and you know the only the only negative experience I had was we we I was on a national debate on the national you know which was like before the days of social media the national was the news you know <laughs> Peter Mann's written national and um, on that panel was um, Ed Broadbent as well as all the other political leaders right and me and Preston Manning right and Ed Broadbent, when I talked about the way we saw the Charlottetown Accord and what we were looking for in terms of uh, change in the country and how the country would function, he said, Judy, you're dreaming and technical. Are you being ridiculous? He said this on national television, right? And that really upset me. Like that was the one thing. I mean, I put up with everything else, but he's supposed to be my ally, right? And he really insulted me, right? Like, just like you're being an idiot. So that was awful. But other than that, you know, 
I, I was used to being attacked. I usually just ignored it. And also because I felt that I was leading a movement. So they're attacking me personally, who cares? You know, I had that ability to do that. But, um, but that stuff with Broadbent was, was tough. That was a hard one. So on the, at the end of the tail end of the campaign, I was in Thunder Bay, I was in Winnipeg and it was near the end of the campaign. And I was on the phone with somebody from CTV about being on a debate show. And I missed my plane to Thunder Bay. Okay. Like I missed it. And so there wasn't another plane for three hours. So I took the next plane. And when I got there, it was at a university auditorium. I wasn't surprised the media waited for me, but there wasn't a seat in the house. Like everybody waited three hours for me to get there. <laughs> That's how much public interest there was. Like the, the, seven, the turnout was 71.8%. Like you don't get anywhere near that in an election. And 54% said no. So this was very significant defeat for the elites in the country, right? And that, that trip to Winnipeg, to uh, Thunder Bay, really showed me that people took it so seriously. Mulroney mailed a copy of Charlottetown Accord to every single household in the country. So nothing like that had ever happened before. And people, you know, I was on every talk show, every call-in show, and people really asked good questions, you know, they took it very seriously. So it got me interested in participatory democracy. And later I wrote a book about participatory democracy because I thought, yeah, this is the, this is the way to change is to give people more of a say in politics. Of course, the reaction of the elites was to completely wipe it out of history. The lead up to the Charlottetown referendum, uh included a number of committees and uh, conferences that consulted the public. You talked about that earlier. Yeah. Uh, the Spicer Commission in particular warned against the fury of Canadians mm -hmm. and said that the public would be against the Charlottetown Accord. Many of these Canadians were on the opposite side of the political spectrum from you though. Mm -hmm. um, and they were arguing for very different constitutional changes. What they wanted to see was very different than what you wanted to see, even though you were both voting no. Right. Um, they say that politics makes for strange bedfellows, but <laughs> did not ever work with any of the people or politicians or organizations on the right to bring about a no vote. No, we never, we decided that at the beginning. We said we're more opposed to the politics of the Reform Party. And don't forget, this was before the Reform Party. I think they had one seat in Parliament at that point. So they were, you know, very anti-feminist, right? So there's no way we could make an alliance with them and we never did. It is true that right-wingers voted against it and left-wingers voted against it. But, um, but we never, we never, you know, we never appeared with them or in any way. And we argued against their position. We, we didn't agree with it, so. How did NAC reconcile the different perspectives that women in Quebec and Quebecois women's organizations had with women in the rest of Canada in the referendum campaign? Well, we didn't have any difference with them in the referendum campaign. We had a difference with them. We had differences on Meech Lake, but not on Charlottetown. Charlottetown included distinct society. And at that point, like I say, I had been fighting this position in English Canada for a couple of years already. And we had agreed that we, the distinct society wasn't the problem. The problem was the Canada clause. And uh, everybody was okay with that by that time in English. I mean, some people still didn't agree, but they were okay with it. So, so what was the difference in between the Canada Clause and Distinct Society? You know, I never, I never agreed with their position on Distinct Society, that it was a threat to women's rights. I never thought that. So it's hard for me to say, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Canada Clause, it was just the lawyer's view that in a court, it would interfere with women's rights. And I had no way of independently assessing that. So I went along with it, right? But you have to realize there were like three currents in NAC opposing it. So indigenous women, which in and of itself might or might not have been enough to say no. For me, it was enough to say no. But I don't know if the whole organization would have said no on that. The childcare movement was against it because of the uh, decentralization of um, social programs. And then the liberal feminists, some of them, not all of them, because some of them supported it. Uh, some of the liberal feminists were against it because of the hierarchy of rights. So you had women in the political parties all supported it, right? And attacked us, you know, NAC doesn't speak for me. That became a whole thing, a whole campaign. 
right? Yeah. Uh, during that time. But our membership, on the other hand, because we had so thoroughly debated this from even before I was president, but even once I became president, I did a whole tour of the country to talk about what the mistake we made with Meech Lake, you see, and to talk about Quebec's right to self-determination and all of that. So that by the time Charlottetown came, they were some members of NAC. We had 500 member groups. There were some members that didn't agree with us, but the Toronto Star called every single one of our member groups and couldn't get anyone to say anything bad about our position because we had thoroughly debated it, right? Mm -hmm. So even the women who had disagreed with what we were doing were satisfied that they had had a hearing, right? So no one spoke against us who were members of NAC, but lots of women who were politicians or corporate leaders or whatever denounced us. Uh, do you think being a Toronto-based president of NAC helped or hindered you during the referendum campaign? Why or why not? Mm, I never really thought about that. Um, I don't think it had really much of an impact. I mean, the president of NAC was some either Ottawa, Toronto, or Montreal always, usually Ottawa or Toronto-based. And um, we had, like I say, all decisions were made with the executive. And in those days, you know, we had actual had in-person meetings four times a year, bring people from all across the country. It was pretty remarkable. And um, yeah, I don't think it had an impact one way or the other. NAC fully supported Indigenous self-government. The Charlottetown Accord would have had self-government recognized in the Constitution, which was a, a huge Change. Uh, most Indigenous groups supported the yes side, yet NAC campaigned on the no side in the referendum. Why did NAC make this choice and how did this affect the campaign and relationships with Indigenous groups? Well, as I, I, I think I said this already, the Native Women's Association of Canada, which was the equivalent of NAC for Native women, and the three Indigenous women on the NAC executive all opposed the Charlottetown Accord for the same reason, which is it took rights away from Native women. Um, nevertheless, it was hard to oppose because it's true that self-government could have been a step forward. And we had had alliances with the Assembly of First Nations on OCA, right? Like we had been very supportive on OCA, the indigenous people. We had organized a full page ad in the globe, demonstrations across the country and, and on free trade. The Assembly of First Nations worked with us in a coalition against free trade. So we had strong connections with the Assembly of First Nations. So it was really hard, really, really hard. And there were people on the left who were denouncing us for opposing the Charlottetown Accord because of the self-government thing. And then it turned out the majority of Indigenous people voted against the accord, actually. So you've touched on this a little bit, but again, it would be good to have it just in one question, one answer. Um, Canada, the politicians, the media, and the people had been talking at the point of the Charlottetown referendum, had been talking about constitutional issues for over a decade. Mm -hmm. um, with the repatriation of the constitution in 1982 and the struggles for section 15 and 28, and then with Meech Lake, um, and then the constitutional conferences. How did the campaigns of the women's movement evolve as the constitutional debates progressed? The 82 repatriation, that's when the women's movement fought for the section 28, right? And that was like I say, liberal feminists. At the time, Doris Anderson, who had been, um, you know, was a very well-known feminist at the time. She had been the editor of Chatelaine and she was now the, uh, I guess it was executive director of the um, Advisory Council on the Status of Women, which is a government appointed body. And she uh, wanted to have a conference of the women's movement on, um, you know, the repatriation of the constitution. And Lloyd Axworthy was the minister responsible for the status of women then, you know, we had a man doing that, there weren't very many women. And, um, and he refused to use government funding to have this conference. And so Doris resigned and she called the conference and the conference happened. So it became like a sort of legendary thing with women's movement that there was this conference. 
on the on section 28 and um, and they you know very strongly supported it. and eventually it got in right but like I say it hasn't been very useful uh, in law, in legal fights at all it's had the opposite effect if anything men have used it more <laughs> effectively than women but anyway um, but at the time they were really sure that it was needed right because it said notwithstanding anything else in the constitution so there couldn't be like if there was a conflict between religious rights and women's rights women's rights would win that was their idea right i think knack was involved in that but not centrally involved it was these liberal feminists so yeah so there had been discussion and the media was all about ho oh, hum this is so boring nobody cares anymore at charlottetown right how can we keep having these constitutional discussions but once there was a referendum all that changed because then there was a very different dynamic and people feel they had some control. It wasn't something way over there. It was something that was going to affect their life and they could vote on it and it changed everything. And so the media was very cynical about it when it started, the referendum campaign, the conferences, all of that, but it completely transformed. And the conferences, I think, helped for that too, because the media paid, because what was new about it was there was all these quote unquote ordinary people in the conferences and they weren't taking sides they were just listening and deciding what they thought and who they agreed with so it was a very interesting democracy democratizing um format what did it do for the women's movement yeah that's a good question i think i think that it set us up as a powerful force and it meant the government became a lot more uh, determined to destroy us like i think they wanted to destroy us early on like the you know, NAC used to have these lob lobbies, we, we call them, where we would meet, we would have an AGM always in Ottawa, and we would meet with the caucuses of each of the parties, and often the mi ministers would come, you know, and I think before my time, prime ministers would come, and um, and it got more and more rowdy and less and less respect to the ministers, you know. And so the first year I was president of NAC, they refused, no, the year before I was president of NAC, they refused to come, the conservative ministers, right? So that process of trying to undermine our credibility had happened before. And it, it probably intensified after Charlottetown. On the other hand, we looked pretty powerful, right? So mixed, mixed reaction. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a final question. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a talk show or like a game show host. Final <laughs> question for a million dollars. No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you said in your book, 10,000 Roses, that the best thing that emerged from the Charlottetown, from Charlottetown was that all parts of the women's movement uh, worked together on it. Yeah. How was consensus achieved and were new alliances and working relationships maintained after the referendum? Mm. Well, um, I'm not sure how to answer that. Yeah, I don't know how to answer that because very soon after Charlottetown, then that was my last year as president of NAC and then Samira got elected and they're into a whole other thing, right? Like in fact, right after Charlottetown, we're mm -hmm. starting to talk about having a woman of color uh, succeed me uh, as president, and um, so everything shifted to that, I think. And, uh, you know, there was an ongoing um, kind of decision among mainstream middle class women that NAC was getting too radical. I think that happened. It's hard to judge what impact that had. Like, it didn't have impact on money. We were raising more money than we'd ever raised before. But that was mainly because nobody else ever had to raise money until me because uh, our funding was enough to pay uh, for the organization. But then when uh, Lynn Kay was president and NAC opposed a free trade agreement with the U.S., um, that's when the conservatives started cutting funding to NAC because we had opposed almost every single one of their big projects, right? So free trade came first and then Charlottetown and free trade. We had an alliance with the union, Charlottetown. We didn't, didn't affect our relationship with the unions. I think, you know, they understood why we did what we did. And so it didn't affect our relationship with the unions. 
It probably affected our support from some upper middle class women. Um, yeah, but that was inevitable anyway, because as neoliberalism came in under Mulroney, inevitably a women's group's either going to move to the left or get co-opted, one of the two, and we were moving to the left. MAC got more radical in reaction to the rise of the right, whereas other women's groups tended to get not more conservative, but more, um, because they had a base, they had to get more support from their local, uh, from their local community, they tended to get more moderate. You know, they couldn't take chances because they were getting money from the Shriners Club or whatever, right? So, uh, so, so I, I'm not sure Charlottetown was a major factor in that, but it was a factor. You know, yeah. it was a factor. They brought in a lot of things they wanted with Charlottetown anyway, right? But they didn't get what they really wanted, so. So, it, that's, it was one of the things you said in the same section about in 10,000 Roses, where most of the things in Charlottetown have been implemented anyway administratively. What did you mean by that? Quebec does have different powers. Um, you know, they just did that. Uh, they, the Canada Clause, I think, I don't even remember what was in it now, so I can't comment on that. <laughs> um, the uh, free trade among the provinces, well, that has been achieved by a process of deregulation on lots of things. Um, elected Senate, obviously, they didn't have. An indigenous self-government, they didn't have. So the things that they really wanted, that they just stuck in the Charlottetown Accord, because it was a place to put it, like free trade, um, they got. That's, that's what I meant. But the other thing which I said, I'm not sure if I said it in 10,000 Roses, is that the night of the victory, of our victory, I was at CBC. And, uh, you know, as a commentator, right, I was still president of NAC. And watching the premiers react to the defeat, I realized that they didn't get why people were opposed. They didn't understand the basis of it. And they weren't going to change. Nothing was going to change. And that all this energy that we had put into it and the risk we had taken, it really wasn't worth it because we won the battle, but we lost the war, which was on neoliberalism, right? And on, um, and, you know, in fact, they just, they never cut NAC while I was president, but as soon as I stepped down, they started to cut NAC again. So, um, yeah, so, so it was a Pyrrhic victory, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was really a Pyrrhic victory.